Hey, I'm Josh, a builder here in New Zealand. And in this video right here, we are gonna break down foundations. We're gonna talk about the types of foundations we use. We're gonna talk about the process and stick around to the end where I'll talk a little bit about how I cost out the projects I'm working on. When this goes down, it triggers so many other things. This is such a key milestone. The foundation of the build and the job is set. The first job that happens before we can do anything on site is a good design. You know, I don't think they're going to put it we engage a designer and an engineer and they will work out the best foundation design for the job we're doing. This will usually involve getting an engineer to do a soil test. They'll bring on site a pentrometer and they'll do a number of blows and they'll write your report telling you exactly where good ground is. Good ground is defined in NZ3604 as having a load bearing capacity of 300 kPa. It's the most common way to measure pressure. Now that the engineer has analysed the soil, the designer and the engineer can work together and they will work out the best foundation design for the job we're doing. And then after we get the plans back from them, the work on site can begin. On this site here, we have to take out about 200 mils of soil and then we have to replace it with 200 mils of compacted base course. Digger drivers over there. We've got a big truck coming in today and the digger will load up the big truck, just do runs of dirt out, bring runs of base course in. In New Zealand, there's two types of foundations we'll use. We used to put piles in the ground, we would put bearers, joists, and timber floor. And we still use timber floors, like I used that on the section nobody wanted. But the most common foundation system we use for new builds is concrete slabs. Before a slab's put down, we'll clear and prepare the site. Morning, we've got the digger on site, bowling down the garage and new house goes here. On this site here we've taken away a garage that was over there, we've taken away all the concrete, we've stripped all the vegetation and topsoil. We then bring in base course which is like a mix of rocks and that gets compacted and then we can start building our foundations on all of that. Behind us, an 800 square meter section. Digger is gonna be on site next week doing a site scrape. Digger and the roller, we're preparing the building platform. And build it up. Yeah, put good hard yeah. So we're back on site and the survey has been in just behind me here, in there, there, and there, in the four corners, and just over here we've set up profiles. That's the point I put in just now. That's the, uh, the front face there, so it's two meters off that. While as a builder we can do a set out ourselves, what we do nowadays is every one of our homes is set out by a surveyor. We get them to come and use their GPS instruments and mark exactly where the corners of the building are going. They put what's called building lines up for us and that marks exactly where the edges of the building are going to be. As the sites get tighter and tighter and as we do more and more of these subdivisions, having little systems like that is important to ensure that we don't put the house in the wrong place. 
So we've also marked over here the floor level and we will then use that as a datum for the rest of the setup. So next step here is pile drivers. The boys will be here this week to mark out the piles. Whenever you've got bad ground, which is common on 50% of the sites we're working on, there's a couple of ways to resolve that. One of the ways is driven timber piles. You can kind of almost guess which sites are gonna need piles and which sites aren't, but it still varies a lot. So here in Upper Hutt, we're in a basin. There's a river over there and the hills over there. Over there, you might have to drive piles to two meters, but then as you come in, you can start getting away with just a rib rough slab designed for a lower ground pressure. The ground was up here, but good ground was down here. The timber piles transfer the load up here all the way down to here. Boys are going to come in tomorrow and chop all of the piles to height. You know what else lays the foundation for a good YouTube channel? Subscribers. Go ahead, click subscribe, help us pump it up. On the section nobody wanted, I decided to go for drilled and filled holes. Which was fine, apart from the day that I went to fill the holes. It was raining a lot. Um, one of my worst days on site. What the heck am I doing in wet weather gears? The thing is, I, I have to. I've got these holes and they've been checked by the engineer and we need to get them filled. Somehow you just get out here and do it. We deliberately placed the house as far uh, that way as we could because we wanted to get as much uh, lawn as we possibly could. We drilled down three meters, put a metal cage in the hole, and then we filled it up with concrete. Because we're right near the edge of the bank, it transfers the load of the house from the top of the bank all the way down to good ground at the base of the bank, and just gives Jeff and Jen peace of mind that the house is not gonna go sliding down the hill. I think there's no hard and fast rule, but it depends on the site, the engineer, how deep you're going, all of those things, and then we'll work out, hey, we think this is the best plan of attack. Worth it in the end though? Absolutely, you feel like you're in the bush. Now that the base course has been laid, we can put all of the plumbing and drainage in that's going to get put under the concrete later on. This can be a really demoralizing stage because we've just gone and made it all flat and perfect and now we're digging it up to put drains in again. Yo, so we're just at the central upper heart site and the boys are setting out for the slab. And we've had the plumber do his subfloor drains and we are now doing what's called boxing. So boxing is like this formwork here, I'll grab a piece. So we have a bunch of this formwork and we set that up around the perimeter and its sole purpose is a hard edge for the concrete to set up to. And then once the concrete's set, we remove this and then this goes to the next job. To hold the formwork in place, we've got a bunch of these braces. Well, we got these custom made by a local metal worker. You know, it sits there, and we just worked out the angle. And we do one of these every 600 mils with wire tar behind it to stop it moving. And yeah, so the biggest thing when you're doing formwork is you just don't want it to move, and you want it to be true to your finished floor size. The next step is a 25 mil layer of sand. Basically the sand's purpose is to prevent the polythene from getting pierced by any sharp rocks.
Yo, it's Monday morning, 8 a.m. and we are just finishing the sand off. And then we'll put the formwork around the outside of the slab. Then we'll do the polythene. The polythene's purpose is to stop any rising damp coming up out of the ground. You might see I'm standing on these big white pods. These are large 1100 by 1100 polystyrene pods. These polystyrene pods also have an insulation value and they form the basis of what's called a rib raft slab. In between each pod is a channel. These channels here are 100 mils. These channels here are 300 mils. The 300 mil ones become an internal load bearing beam and the 100 mil ones just space each pod and have a one reinforcing rod up the middle of them. Wade's bent all of the external steel cages off-site, which is awesome. Made the use of a rainy day on Friday. And now we're going to cut and bend the internal pile cages. So we're going to make 26 more of these. What do you reckon, Dan, that versus manual bending, how much quicker? Um, 15 times quicker. 15 times. Dan's official review is 15 times faster. The next thing we'll do is lay out a whole bunch of these chairs. These chairs make sure that we lift the steel up off the pods and keep it the perfect amount of distance below the surface of the concrete. But you don't want your steel too close to the surface, but you also don't want it right down the bottom. You want even amount of coverage of concrete over your steel. There's two main things that will go into your slab. There is a lot of steel. That's a mix of steel mesh and reinforcing rods and obviously a lot of concrete. Yo, good morning, it's Saturday morning. Just finished pouring the Silverstream rear lot slab. So good to see it going down. I like to point out to people that, hey, we can give you a pretty good understanding of costs based on everything from the surface up. But if you want to know about what's happening from the surface down, the best way to do that is to get an engineer to do a soil test. They'll bring on site a pentrometer and they'll do a number of blows and they'll write your report telling you exactly where good ground is. And if you're worried about buying a site, that may have been in a previous swamp. That should be something you're doing. The thing to remember is to find good ground, it's not like it's gonna double the build budget. It, it will definitely add a cost, but it's not gonna be like double or triple your build budget. On this one here, we have to drill 59 holes to a depth of 1.5 meters. So what I do is I'll go back to another job for example, the section nobody wanted, we had to drill 57 holes from memory to four meters deep. So I keep a time log of that and I can look at the drill piles and at the time, these are the figures I spent 103 hours and we used one pump and four grain of concrete and the digger driver's fee. So I can look at that job and say, well, if that was 57 holes to four meters deep and that cost that much, now we're in, I'm giving my clients an estimate on 59 holes to 1.5 meters deep. I can use that. Pretty 
0.225 of a hole, 1.5. So then we go 59 holes, 0.25 is 14 cube. And we times that by our concrete rate and that gives us the concrete price. Hopefully you learned something new about foundations. For extra content, you can also head over to my mailing list, nzbuilder.co.nz slash smokochat, where I share some of my tips, tricks, insights, the things I've learned building houses over the years.